the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us tonight. We thank you in gratitude for the blessings that we do have in our life, the blessings of family, of children, of life, of faith, of this community. We ask today that you bless the children upstairs and open their hearts, help them to be receptive to you, receptive to grace, receptive to your call. We ask your blessing upon all those in our world today that are struggling. We pray for Jessica. We pray for Father Hollow. We pray for those who have cancer, terminal illness. We pray for those infected by COVID-19. We pray for doctors, nurses, and all those in the healthcare profession that they may help them and aid them and strengthen them and be your healing hands. We also ask tonight uh, that your Holy Spirit come upon us and help us to be receptive and open. We may learn your way and your will, and we may bring it to completion. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you again uh, for being with us uh, on this journey to bring your children to the two amazing sacraments. You've already had them baptized, and now we bring them to the Sacrament of Reconciliation and First Holy Communion. So a few things. Um, I think you probably all have this in your hand. If you don't, uh, this resource is, is golden. And I just want to like, this is gold. Like this is like, and I'll take you through it. If um, some of you may have had a child that have already, has already received this um, in times past. So for those of you who know, we have a person in our parish. Her name is Pam Yall. She is an artist. And so she did all of these drawings herself. She is also the one who did the mural at the top of the stairs when you walk in that has the image of the Good Shepherd. So she did all of that. Uh, she also, uh, I'm not supposed to tell anybody this, but like if you go to the outdoor mass, she's the one that just painted the images that are on the front of the altar in the ambo. She's just like totally humble. She never wants any credit or anything, and I give her credit. So anyways, um, so what this is, um, this is the mass. It's a little missile for your children. They can color it, or if you don't like the way your children color and you like to color, you could color it for them uh, because it's the perfect, like, the style is actually done kind of like a coloring book style. But it takes you, it's word for word, the entire mass. But then on top of that, it also has pictures. And this is the crazy part, is that these pictures, out, these pictures are our parish. So if you actually look at, like, if you look at the mass facing the people, this is a combination of, like, all of our altars, like that altar backdrop, is a, like it has the crucifix from St. Martin's, it has the tabernacle from St. John's, it has the lower altar from St. Paul's. Um, but if you like page through here, like it's actually me celebrating mass as a cartoon person. And if you actually look at our server, so like if you turn the mass facing the people and you just open that book, that is uh, Danny Deddens and Logan Tenenfeld. It's like completely, like the whole thing is like, Randy Schneider is in here. Um, this is, um, uh, I'm totally losing her name. Stinger, John Stinger's oldest girl. Olivia. That's Olivia Stinger right there. Um, anyways, it's, uh, the whole thing just kind of blows my mind. But then also like all the artwork, it, like on this page, like the, all of those are so the statues in the Adoration Chapel. Um, this is Matt Steele, who will make you a killer sandwich at Subway. Um, so anyways, the whole thing is really, but anyways, so if you go through it one way, it's mass facing the people. If you flip it over, it's then mass facing the east. The pictures are all adjusted, and um, of course, it's the same prayers. Um, but then also, what we did is we went through, and we tried to throw in, like, little cate 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 catechetical teaching moments. So, like, why do we ring bells? What color vestment is Father wearing? So hidden throughout it are all these little Q&A little uh, questions and answers. And then she also did this really cute thing with the, with the angels, like whether you stand or you sit or you kneel, the angel is doing that all throughout the little book. So anyways, so this is exclusively all saints right here. Um, it's just... Uh, we need to copyright it, and we need to actually sell this, in my opinion, but um, it's awesome. So anyways, so this is uh, if the, the best way uh, often for children to learn is 
and this is why teachers do what they do in classes, is different people learn in different ways. So if we want our children to learn the mass, we can just take them. But often them literally reading along will help them understand the prayers better, memorize them better, know them better. And then the visuals is a great way back at home uh, as well to have that reinforced. So if you lose this, we have more, and all they cost us is the paper at this point because we can literally just, we actually had a printer actually print these for us, but it's really just a great resource and tools for it. So any questions about this? It's so awesome. Okay, here we go. More resources. Um, you should have picked up this as you came in. Um, this is the BLESSED program, First Reconciliation. Um, you, you haven't had to do anything yet with it, but it has the DVDs. Remember, all of these DVDs are all, all of these videos are all online. So you don't need a DVD player, and the books are all online as well uh, if you ever lose them um, or things of those sorts. And this, this past year, for parents who don't have any more younger children, uh, there are some parents who donated their books back as well. So like at the end of this, if you're like, this was really great. I really appreciated it. But like, this is just going to go like collect dust on my dust on my shelves. If you want to turn these back in at the end of the year, you're more than welcome uh, to do so. But you're not required to. I actually, if you look at the artwork in the books, it's really beautiful. So they're also they're also worth keeping, uh, in my very humble opinion. And then um, you did you did not get tonight, but just so you know, uh, for once you start watching these little uh, animations. The main, the main character is a boy and a girl, but they have a pet hamster. And so if you want to buy for your child, you can buy them. Uh, his name is Hemingway, which is Matthew Kelly's famous, fav favorite artist, one, one of his favorite uh, authors. But anyways, you can buy this little guy. Just so you know, I'm just marketing. Here I am. Um, it really is awesome, by the way. So uh, and he comes in his own box, but that is available if you'd like that. Uh, they weren't originally making these, and then they, I saw a prototype when I visited one time, and then I pretty much demanded that they make them. So uh, please buy some, because it'll make me look less, like less of a fool for uh, encouraging them to be made. I'm going to pass, you want to pass these back? What I'm giving you is really the outline. We're going we're gonna to cover the first three sessions, session one, session two, session three. And then it's kind of my hope that you're able to just go through those sessions with your child, if possible, um, prior to our next session. And then we'll go through, I'll, I'll kind of, I, I refer to this as kind of like teaching the teacher. My goal is to just give you kind of like some more adult information uh, so that you are all the more, feel all the more equipped and ready uh, to cover these sessions with your children. Um, you can watch them, of course, with them, and, but sometimes it's great to know our faith at, at a little deeper level uh, in general. So first session is all about gratitude, and this is like one of Matthew Kelly's like really, really big things is that gratitude is a game changer. So for those of you who like YouTube, for those of you who like um, inspirational or motivational stuff, I always, whenever we talk about gratitude, I always talk about there's this, there's a book, um, there's also a bunch of YouTube motivational videos called Million Dollar Morning. So there is this sociological study about millionaires. And what are the common traits of millionaires? Now, we as Christians would not say that millionaires are the most successful people in the world, right? Because money doesn't make you successful. Money can't buy you love. However, we can at least say, like, they get some aspect of success, right? So there's this thing called Million Dollar Morning, and it, it, it studies what are the sociological traits of millionaires. And it's actually really, really interesting. The traits of millionaires, if you baptize them, it would be the traits of a religious sister or a religious priest. That's actually living their faith because there's some religious priests and religious sisters that might not be actually doing a really good job with that. So really successful people begin their mornings unplugged from technology. So they don't allow the outside world to spoil their day. So it's all about how they begin their day. 
most successful people in the world begin their morning with exercise. Most successful people begin their day with silence. Now, this is where, you, the, once again, if you baptize it, if they're a Hindu, they're saying their prayers. If they're a Muslim, they're saying their prayers. But if they're a Catholic or a Christian, they're also saying their prayers. But they, they believe that, that beginning a day in, in silence, in prayer, is a game changer in their life. So no technology, exercise, silence. They also begin their day by planning their day prior to being bombarded by the day. So these are the things I will get done today. And then the last thing on the list is every single one of them practices intentional gratitude. Which means beginning my day, counting my blessings intentionally instead of beginning my day thinking about all the things I need to do or being like forced into the frustration of life. So I'm going to intentionally begin my day with gratitude. I mentioned this solely in the fact that like gratitude really is a game changer and if we look at the life of the church, like at the heart of the church is what we're going to lead your children to, which is the Eucharist. So the Greek word for Eucharist is Eucharistia. And if you tr just translate that word, Eucharistia, in Greek, it means thanksgiving. So the celebration of Mass is really supposed to be us as Christians, like giving thanks to God. Now, for what? Well, we thank God for food, we thank God for clothing, we thank God for health, we thank God for family. But it's us thanking the Father for the Son who brings us salvation. So it's us receiving the Son, body, blood, soul, and divinity, upon the altar and offering it to the Father in thanksgiving. So the way that we show our gratitude to someone, right, is we, like, if someone does something nice to me, what, 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 what's, what, what's my automatic response? I, I want to give them something back, right? So you do something nice to me, my thought is like, oh, I need, out of gratitude, I, I'm going to either write you a thank you note, send you a text, or buy you, you know, have some flowers delivered to your house, or give you some cookies. If I'm grateful, I'm going to show somehow my affection. By the way, I was listening to the radio the other day, and which I do every now and then, um, and there was a debate on the Christian radio station on whether brides in 2020, whether it was socially acceptable after their bridal shower or after their wedding for them to take a picture of the thing that the person gave them and send a thank you text. So that was like the question on the morning show was like, is this like socially acceptable for me to take a picture of the, I don't even know, like people don't get China anymore, but take a picture of the new waffle maker and send it to your friend and say, thanks for the waffle maker. Like, is that socially acceptable? Of course, like, my mind is like, no, that's not socially acceptable. But of course, people are like, oh, that's totally awesome. Like, I would really appreciate that. That person probably is saying that because most people don't send a thank you note at all, and they bought on the waffle maker, and they never got anything from anybody. Uh, but at least that's what's going through my mind, that that would be socially acceptable. But nonetheless, um, for any of you who did that on the day of your wedding, I love you, and it's totally fine. Um, I use it as when we receive something, our automatic should be to show gratitude. So we've received the Son from the Father. So at the Mass, we actually present the Son back to the Father. Like the, the Mass is also us offering the Son through him. We, we're on Calvary offering the great act of thanksgiving to the Father. We'll get to those theologies later, but, but at the heart of what it is to be a Christian, because the Mass is the center of all of it, so we bring to the Mass the other things we're thankful for, but at the heart of the Mass is also us thanking the Father for the Son. So the first session is all about gratitude. The first session is all about gratitude. And I just want to, like, if you can dr drive this home with your kids, like, drive this home, because gratitude will change their life. Gratitude will change their life. The more grateful you can make a kid, the more joyful and happy that kid is going to be for the rest of their life, right? We pass out this book now to our parents that just received a that, that, that just have a child baptized. 
from age 24 hours, 24 hours old to age nine, you got like nine years to form your child. This is like the new studies. Like your first nine years of parenting are like your most important years. Like your children are most likely seven now. You got two years to like drill in like gratitude and charity and like mercy and love. like drill it in people. So two years ago, I think we started this program. I think this is my, two years we started this program. So one of the things that you're going to see in the video, and it's actually really kind of cute, it's well done, but the, the, the kids decide to sit down and they're going to name 100 things they're grateful for. And so these, the group of cartoon characters are just like li listing off everything from chocolate to uh, football to their mom and their dad. And one of the parents um, gave that challenge to their kids and made their kids write down 100 things they were thankful for. And... I think like taking what you're, what this tool that you're being given and using it and utilizing it is going to be, that's where the game changer comes in. How do we again and again and again instill gratitude? I've told some of you like, and probably going to reveal why I disagreed that a text was okay. In the Meyer household, um, and it's so great that like my parents like come to mass at our parish because like you guys all like know what my parents look like. Just subtract like, you know, 40 years and uh, that's who raised me. Um, at the Meyer household, my mom was um, <laughs> insistent on gratitude would be the best way to put it. So this is no joke how things went at the Meyer household. Hi, it's Christmas morning. Like, let's go open your presents. So we would open our presents, and then like we would, be, it would be like so much joy, and it'd be like fantastic. And, like look at all these toys, and like Aunt D sent me fifty bucks or whatever else, and it was great. And then um, we would have like our big Christmas dinner and and eat eat our meal. And then um, my mother would say, "Okay, like who wants to play with their toys?" And we were like, "I do," and she was like, "Great, you need to write your thank you letter first. Because you, you need to express your gratitude for what everyone gave you prior to you actually using it. The same thing with true, like, I'm like, no joke, like 14, 15 years old, like, someone gave me money and, like, I can't spend my money until, like, I write the thank you note. And, like, toys were held hostage. And you can imagine, I don't know if you know how stubborn I am, I can be kind of a little stubborn, whatever. So, like, sometimes I would, like, not write the thank you note. I would play with my old toys and not play with the new toys. But, um, it instilled in me that gratitude is key. And, grat and for those of you who all, like, if you ever do anything for me, you normally get an illegible gratitude note back from me in the mail that you can't read. I go over to people's homes sometimes to, like, do a house blessing, and on their fridge is, like, a thank you note that I wrote them, and then they'll make it like, yeah, thank you so much for that. We don't know what you wrote in your thank you note, but thank you. Because uh, my handwriting is horrible. But um, I at least sent the note, which was the the really, really important thing, but in our way of prayer as Christians, and we'll talk about prayer in a later session, but there are four major ways of prayer. The first is adoration, which is really the highest form of prayer. That's what we'll do for the rest of our lives in heaven. Second is thanksgiving. Third is contrition or prayers of sorrow, like I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then the last is prayers of, of asking, prayers of petition. So adoration, thanksgiving, contrition or sorrow, and then lastly, petition. So those are the four ways of prayer. Gratitude is a game changer and a life changer. And the more that we can teach these children to be thankful, like it's just going to make your life a heck of a lot easier. Like the kids that warm people's hearts, the kids who walk up to somebody and says, oh, thank you so much for doing what you did today, or thank you so much for this, or thank you so much for that. Like, we all know that. And it's our responsibility as parents, as priests, as church, to, like, help them to become those people of gratitude. So um, that is session number one. Session number two um, gets rooted in Matthew Kelly's big list of so for those of you who don't know Matthew Kelly's history, when he was 18 years old, he started traveling across the United States of America at the age of 18. 
giving retreats and seminars. His, his life is really kind of crazy. So he actually began when he was in high school doing like retreat ministry in Australia. And he like, his life is all about being in the right place at the right time. He became so successful really, really quick in Australia that he came to America and then began traveling all across America speaking in parishes. He would sleep in rectories and that's what started his life. And he, when he began preaching in a certain sense, if you want to call it that, but leading retreats, and he would start talking about how God wants you to be a saint and God wants you to be holy, he just felt like people had like a glass look in their face and they didn't get it and they were, they were like saint statue, saint, holy card, like it was this static image that didn't, he f- believe moved people. So then he came up with this, this, this term, becoming the best version of yourself, which is, means that in every single moment, the question that we need to ask is, am I striving for greatness? Am I striving to be who God is calling me to be? Am I striving to be the best version of myself? And it really is a great question. Um, so you can ask your child, do you want to be a saint? You can also ask your child, do you want to be the best version of yourself at every single moment? And are you being the best version of yourself at this very moment? So a great way to like ask your children like when they're doing something wrong is like, is what you're doing right now, is that you, is that you being the best version of yourself? Or are you being a lesser version of yourself? So I want to talk about one of my favorite virtues in the whole entire world that is like completely dead in our, in our world right now. It's called magnanimity. Magnanimity. Check it out, look it up. Magnanimity is the virtue of striving for greatness. Striving for greatness. Think about when we were in high school and we were in college, what was the question that like normally was in our mind when we were like in a class? What is the absolute least I can do to pass this class? And then we would have in our mind like a, like a level. So like, what is the least I can do to get an A? What's the least I can do to get a B? For some of us, it might be, what is the least I can do to get a C? For some of us, like, I don't even care. What is the least I can do to get a D minus, pass this class, and get away from this professor, or get away from this topic, because I just don't really care. But our world thrives off of minimalism. Our world thrives off of this, it's really a toxic belief that, like, I will get by with the least. The question that Matthew Kelly asks, have, asks is like, how do I flip that and say, what is the greatest thing that I could do? What is the greatest way that I could show love, mercy, compassion? What is the best way that I could become who I'm called to be? Not just how do I get by. People who are truly happy in life, people who live lives of of great contentment are people who are striving for greatness. Mother Teresa didn't become a saint because she said, what's the least I can do for these people? Mother Teresa became a saint because she said, what's the, what, what, is the, what is the most radical thing I could do for these people who are poor? If you think back to your coaches, if you think back to your moms, your dads, your, dads, your aunts, your uncles, who like touched your heart, they most likely in that relationship with you, we're asking, what, is, what can I do? What's the greatest thing I can do to help this person? To help my niece, my nephew, my grandchild, my athlete become the greatest that they can be. And so when we love other people, we want to ask that question for the other people. What can I do to help this, this person become the best version of themselves? We can ask it for ourselves, and then we can flip it and say, okay, what am I doing in my life that's keeping me from being a saint, being holy, being the best version of myself, um, and how do, I, how do I change that? How do I adapt? So within this second session, the Ten Commandments get, get brought in. So we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments tonight. If you don't have the Ten Commandments memorized, this is a great time to memorize the Ten Commandments. I'm going to help you right now. So first three commandments, first three commandments have to do with God. The next seven have to do with your neighbor. I'm in this program called Exodus 90 right now, which is, it's a 90-day program. 
I end on, uh, on November 1st. And um, so we, you read through the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, which is where the, Moses receives the Ten Commandments and the Israelites go out of, go through, go through Egypt. And um, it's really interesting just like reading it over again. Like if you go back and read the book of Exodus and look when God gave the Ten Commandments, the first three commandments, each, par- each commandment is like a really, 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 really long run-on sentence. And then when you get to the seven commandments that have to deal with your neighbor, they're all like really, really short. I mentioned that in the fact of like, those first, if we understand those first three commandments, I mean, if we genuinely love God, if we genuinely honor his name, if we genuinely honor his day, like, we will through that ultimately honor his creation, which is our neighbor. If love of God is primary in our life, and that's why it's awesome that your kids are upstairs and I mean this, there is genuinely a difference between someone who, 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 who loves God and loving God will lead to us loving our neighbor. The two of them do go hand in hand. What is the great commandment that when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he says, you should love the Lord your God with your, your heart, your mind, your soul. And then what does he say? And, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. So the two of them do go hand in hand. And the Ten Commandments are broken up in that sense. The Ten Commandments are also broken up, by the way, in in an order, in an order of most importance. So let's quickly go through the, the seven. So, so the first three, you shall have no other gods besides me. Like we would all agree that's like a pretty big deal, right? Second is honor our Lord's name because he's a person. Third, honor his day. And once again, if you're honoring him, go back to the first one, then you are going to honor his name, and you are going to honor his day. But going down, so then this is, what is the fourth commandment? Honor your mother and father. So they are listed. Thomas Aquinas makes this very clear. The, the, the Ten Commandments are listed in, honor, in, in order of importance. Honoring your mother and father is more important than you shall not kill. Do your children understand that? <laughs> Why, though? Because the day that you and your husband or wife chose to bring a child into this world, you did something with God. Like, two human beings creating a child is a divine act. It's a human act, but it's also a divine act because that child has, a, has an immortal soul. And you as parents, we call you co-creators. Who's the only creator in this world? God. But who's a co-creator? You are. So you literally become a co-creator. And in this child's life, like you actually, your role is, is, is absolutely astronomical. The commandment of Honor your mother and father, I always have to say, is a commandment of justice. So we're all, like, old. I might be older than you, I might be younger than you, but, like, we can definitely say that, like, we're old compared to the little kids that are up there or these cute little kids that are right here. When I look at the, at the fourth commandment at this point in my life, I'm 44 years old, my parents are in their 70s, um, I truly see it as a commandment of justice. What do I mean by that? So my parents, until I was 18, actually until I was 20 years old, 22 years old, like they paid for everything in my whole entire life. They drove me, they sheltered me, they took care of me when I was sick. I mean like this is your life, right? Your whole life, like, and, and sometimes like you might ask yourself the question, do I exist for any other reason than to serve my child? Like, right? Like, and there's times where you're just like, do I ever get to live? So then when you ask your child to take out the trash and they throw a temper tantrum 
And it's just like, wait, hold up. Like, I bought you your clothes, paid for your food. I'm going to drive you to football practice and soccer practice and uh, take out the trash or clean your room or whatever else it might be. And they go crazy in a relationship of justice. That behavior is intolerable. In a relationship of exchange, it's intolerable. Now, of course, we don't do what we do in a strict sense of justice. We do what we do out of love, out of mercy, out of an overabundance of love. But that, that fourth commandment really is and this is, I mean, just so you know, like when your kids come into confession, like at, at the age of eight, I don't pull this on them. But when kids come in at the age of like 14 and 15 and they confess the sin of like not obeying their parents, like just so you know, I got your back. And they, I, I literally will look at the kid who's slumped in the chair and I, I, I just start it. I'm like, who bought those shoes? Mom. Who bought those jeans? Mom. Who bought that shirt? Mom, do you have a bed? Yeah. Is there heat in your house? Yeah. Where does your food come from? Mom and dad. Who pays your electricity bills? Dad. I'm, and that, so I'm, I'm like, I want you to go home and I want you to make a list of everything your parents have ever done for you. And then I want you to make a list of all the things you've done for your parents. And then ask the question when your parents tell you to do your homework, to be at home at a certain time, to get good grades, like ask yourself, what are they really asking of you? They're asking nothing in comparison to what they're giving you. Now, what's crazy is that make that then make that jump back to the first, second, and third commandment. What does God give us? And what do we give back? So these commandments are, they're, they're really, really key. And God sees the role of a parent as being so amazing. And he wants us to understand that, that just as we should give gratitude and thanksgiving and give back to our parents, that we should be doing the same ultimately for him. Fifth commandment and following down as we know they, they clearly reveal our relationship, our inner relationship with each other and how we're called to live that. So this is, a, and I might get this wrong. I, I really hope that I don't, but we'll see there. Okay, so this is, how, this is a way to remember the Ten Commandments. So, and as you use your fingers and all of them, it literally is counting the Ten Commandments. I'm going to see if I can do this wrong. Ready? So, first commandment, we believe in one God. I've already... Forgotten. Hold on. Hold on. I can do this. Does anybody else know this? Why am I doing this? This is Taylor Marshall. Uh, well, how am I totally forgetting all of this? They're like little hand gestures. One God. Honor his name. Why am I? I'm totally killing this. Fourth is honor your father and mother. So that one God, why am I not thinking of two? Two is his name, but I can't think of what that, can't think of how that looks. Maybe it's this name. Is it like an N? Three is key. Oh, three is K. Keep holy the Sabbath. Or is it is this way? Which one is a K? Is this a K or we're facing you? Okay. So one is one God. Two is Oh, no, this is a V. Yeah, okay, sorry. One, he pulled his Sabbath. Two, do not take the Lord's name in. Three, keep holy the Sabbath. Four, honor your mother and father. Five, thou shalt not kill. Six, this is committing adultery because I'm taking someone else's wife. Seven is... Um, yeah, the, um, it's like this again, thou shalt not steal. Eight, 
is um, eight is bearing false witness. Oh, it's going like this. I'm telling you a lie because lies are often said in the dark. And then nine is um, coveting your neighbor's possessions. And now I forget that one. And then I'm totally dying on the last two. And then 10 is uh, covering your neighbor's uh, wife. I don't remember that one either. Darn it. But anyways, I, I will brush up on those. But so first commandment is what? One God. Second is don't take him in vain. Number three is keep holy the Sabbath. Four is five. Six. Seven is that you shall not. Eight, don't bear false witness or don't lie. Nine is uh, desiring your neighbor's goods and desiring your neighbor's wife. But I, I don't remember what those were for nine and ten. But anyways, they're really good. So anyways, there's your little uh, finger ways to remember. The, and I can't believe that totally. I will get those all to you. But it's a great way to remember the Ten Commandments. I like little things like that because I'm not very smart. As you can see, um, that's how I would memorize everything when I was in uh, college, is I would always like, come up with like little things because um, I wasn't very smart. Okay. Um, when we talk about the Ten Commandments, and when you talk about sin with your children, I think it's key to talk about sin in a proper understanding of the fact that like God really does want you to be happy. And when we really look at sin, like every sin is us choosing something that doesn't ultimately lead to happiness. So like I always like to like look at confession. Like when I go to confession or someone goes to confession, I think confession is like a long list of things that didn't work. Like I tried this, it didn't work. I thought this would make me happy, it didn't work. I did this and that didn't work. But like, because like we're not stupid. Like we're really not. Sometimes we do stupid things, but we're not stupid. And when I say that we're not stupid, that means that like at the moment that we do something, we really do believe somehow that that's going to like make us happy. Like there's a belief that somehow that action, that gesture, that word, that decision is somehow going to make me happy. The problem is, is that at, at that moment we're, 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 we're not thinking clearly because it really won't. It's a disordered thought. That thought isn't ordered to the ultimate good. And that's what the devil does. That's deception. That's sin. But God made us good, and we desire the good, and the perceived good, it's not the real good, the perceived good is what we fall for. So we fall for a perceived good and actually choosing the real good, which is actually always God's laws. Right now, you know, the big debate in America about the new Supreme Court justice and uh, all of these things, and, you know, like, there is never a case where killing a baby is a good decision. Like, there's never a situation where, like, killing a baby is a good decision. So, like, the debate on abortion is, 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 is a, like, there's never a, a, a situation that that's a, that that's a good choice. And so, the ramifications of it, the ramifications of abortion are, are huge in our, in our country, in our land, in our world. Like suicide, depression, like the list goes on of the, the aftermath. So take that, put it in a microcosm into our own selves. Like there's never a situation where lying is really a good thing. There's never a situation where cheating is really a good thing. We, 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 we think that it is, but it's really not. There's never a situation in your life where you can look back and be like, dude, when I got like so absolutely crazy drunk, like that was awesome. It really wasn't. 
at the moment, though, what's the perceived good? Just one more beer is just, I'm, it's just going to be awesome. Just one more beer is going to be stinking awesome. But it never leads that way. The desire, like, at the moment, the thought is good. But we know that the outcome will never lead to where it ultimately is. So perceived good and so when we look at like sin, like a great way to look at sin, like, and I mean this, is like, is like these are things that just, like, I thought were going to work, but they didn't. Now, when we talk about sin, very clear here, there are two types of sin, mortal sin and venial sin. So the best way to make the distinction is this. Mortal sin is premeditated murder. Venial sin is unintentional manslaughter or homicide or the insanity plea. So premeditated, premeditated murder means what? I, I fully know what I'm doing. I'm completely right in my mind and in my faculties. I have full knowledge. So I know that it's wrong. I'm freely choosing it. And it's a really big deal. Like killing your neighbor's cat, I'm not like, or, your, or dog, or uh, chicken, um, like doesn't get you in jail, I don't think, does it? I don't know, I've never killed anybody's, not intentionally at least. Um, but like, there's a difference between killing your neighbor's cat and killing your neighbor's husband. There's a gravity. So, so the three things that are necessary for a mortal sin are full knowledge. I know that this is wrong. Full consent, which means I'm freely choosing it. And then lastly is that it's actually really, really bad. So we would say that's a mortal sin. I know it, full knowledge. I can choose it, and it's really bad. So this is why these children are upstairs right now. Because what can they do? They can do all three of those now. A few years ago, like, can either of these little kids, they can't do any of that. Some of you might be like, my husband still can't do any of that either. <laughs> or my wife, whatever. But, like, there comes a point where, like, we can actually choose and learn and know. So when any of those are lacking, so genuinely, let's speak of, let's, let's um, I never know like, the, the proper words to, to speak of. But let's speak about uh, an individual with special needs, and they don't have the mental capacities to freely choose. That individual actually cannot commit a mortal sin. And the church actually applies to them the title of holy innocence, which is what we call all the little babies that were killed on, uh, at, the, at the birth of Christ. That there's holy innocence, and we would believe that a person who has severe mental uh, capacities we, 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 where, where they can't freely choose or make a decision, that those individuals actually would go directly to heaven and be saints. Just as we would believe that an, a baby who dies is a saint in heaven. Vaughn Fisher is a saint in heaven. Miles Oleg is a saint in heaven. Like we believe that, that is, our, that, is our, that is our belief because they don't have the ability to really choose evil. So full knowledge, they have to know that it's wrong. So that's another great thing as well, by the way. So in my early priesthood, um, so I got banned from preaching at one point, not in a negative way, it was really kind of done, it was done by our bishop. So I was, the, uh, I was the director of youth ministry for my first five and a half years of priesthood. And then I made the decision to stop doing that and um, but when I was the director of youth ministry for the archdiocese, I would like preach at like high schools all over the place, and I was doing a bunch of theology of the body stuff. I'd like give so I'd be giving like three or four talks like a week, and in gyms with a thousand kids. And anyways, it was like getting too much, and so I met with the bishop, and I was like, Bishop, like I don't know if I can keep doing this. I might burn out. And then he said, You need to go on a, away on a retreat. And I came back from the retreat, and I, he said, So where where are you at with all this? I said, Well, really, I said I don't want to be the director of youth ministry anymore. And he said, really? Are you serious? Because I was his director of the diocese. And he said, yeah. 
I said, I, I want to just be in a parish, so can I leave, like, now? And um, he wasn't very happy. And he said, so we, we worked things out, and I left, like, in a week, a, a month and a half after I made the decision, which is very gracious of him. But he then told me that I was not allowed to speak outside of my parish, um, which was, like, very humbling. But it was kind of his moment and way to be able to be like, okay, like, you're going to crap on me, I'll crap on you. So anyways, um, but anyways, one of my favorite things to do is like to walk into a high school gymnasium, giving like a chastity talk, you know, about like sex and whatever else to a whole bunch of kids. And like, I mean, I was really stupid when I was a kid. Like, I mean, like Terry and Dwayne were like good parents. Like I'm not like, no, but I was like really dumb. Um, I didn't like really know much about any things. So like I was ignorant a lot of the sins that I committed and things of these sorts. So like I would totally love to like walk into like a high school gym and just like totally like wreck their lives. Um, because a lot of them like were like me where like they thought that like as long as I don't have sex, I'm totally okay. Like sex is like totally like not good. I, I know I shouldn't do that. So I'm gonna be a good boy or a good girl, like not have sex, but like anything else, like whatever. So like, I would like walk into like gymnasiums and like do all these like really stupid, silly things, and then all of a sudden I would just like drop truth on them, and then I would be like, and now all of you are culpable, because now you all know, and you didn't know before, but now you know now, and now you need to deal with it. So, welcome. Um, so full knowledge, we need to know it. This is why we form consciences. We need to form our conscience properly. That's what these children, God willing, are learning upstairs. That's what you're hopefully teaching in their home, right from wrong, what is good, what are God's laws, and why they're really good for us, because God wants us to be happy, and when we choose things, we're not happy. God wants us to be happy, so he gives us the laws so that we don't do things that will make us miserable. So full knowledge, full consent, meaning I can freely choose it. So it's not just the fact that I have the mental capacities to do so, but also you would bring in here all the other things. Like we can get into some really crazy, like, moral theologies here, but like if you get totally drunk and you do stupid things, you're actually less culpable than if you weren't drunk. Like this happens in the court of law as well. So full knowledge, full consent. If I'm in a, if I, if, if I'm in an absolute rage and anger, do I have full capacity to make full, full consent? I don't. But also, to be able to make a quick clarification here, sins that are done to you, you're not culpable for. So if a sin is done to you against your will, you're not culpable for that. That's not your sin. That's someone else's sin. So full knowledge, full consent, grave matter, meaning that it is really uh, a grave condition. If one of those is lacking, it shifts from a mortal sin to a venial sin. So mortal sins are sins, we, we, meaning mortal, meaning we believe that they kill the, the life of grace within us. Venial sins, we believe that the life of grace can still live with, within us. It's just wounded. The analogy, the best analogy that I always like to, to, to use here is like a boat on, a, on, on water. If the water is totally still, like a sheet of glass, you're like, you're doing great. When there's a lot of waves, those are venial sins. The reality is the more waves that they are, what, what, what's, what's more likely to happen for the boat to capsize, which would be mortal sin? So the more waves that there are, this is why going to confession, even when we're not in mortal sin, is really important. Because the more that we rid ourselves of the waves, the more that the boat will stay up. So we confess venial sins as well as mortal sins, knowing that it keeps us in right relationship. And the more that we work on the little things, the more that the big things will take care of themselves. As a coach, like, the little things all matter. And the little things will take care of the big things. Um, okay. Questions on anything I said? Because I've, I've been, like, just throwing out a lot of stuff here. Everybody doing okay? Is this helpful? Okay. Lastly, I want to talk about baptism, um, which I think is really up in that first session. And for just for those of you who are just like super excited, excited to see St. Martin's campus as a cartoon, that happens in that first, in that, in that second video um, where it talks about baptism because they go to St. Mar Martin's, which they really call St. Francis, but it really is St. Martin's in Yorkville. Um, 
so you all had your children baptized. Thank you for doing that, sincerely. I just want to do a quick catechesis on baptism um, itself. Um, baptism for us. So I think it's always interesting to look at Judaism because Judaism is our foundation. Like, we really would actually still be called Jews if they would have all converted, which is what they were supposed to do. So Jesus was a Jew. He came to, like, to bring the fulfillment of Judaism. So if all the Jewish people would have converted like they were supposed to, like, we wouldn't have Christianity. That might be hard to understand, but like sometimes like people will, I, I still get asked the question all the time, like, so if we're Christians, then why was Jesus a Jew? Well, Jesus was a Jew because like he was born of Mary, who was a Jew, and all of the religious leaders rejected him. So eventually the Christians had to make a choice which was to separate themselves from the people who should have naturally accepted who Christ was. And it was so bad that they actually said, hey, you want to what? <laughs> Look at all these people that aren't Jewish. Let's go preach the gospel to them. And they were more accepting than the Jewish people. Thank you. That's right, they did. And um, so it's interesting, I think, always to look at our foundation. Our foundation is Judaism. What happens on the eighth day of every Jewish boy's life? He's circumcised. Does that eight-year-old boy make a choice to do that? No, he's eight years old. He can't choose. I always like to make the little joke that if, you know, there's always like the thought, some of you may have gotten this from your friends, like, why are you having your child baptized? Like, why don't you wait until he's like 13 to make his own decision? Like, this is just weird. Like, why are you forcing that on him? I was like, dude, if they did that with Judaism and they wait until you were 13 or 14 years old to like circumcise your boy, there would be no Jews. Okay, like no 13 or 14 year old boy is going to allow you to like cut off part of his penis. Like, it's just like not going to happen. And like, nobody thinks about it, but it's really true. Like converting to Judaism, if like, you're not circumcised as a man, is like, I would imagine would be absolutely crazy. But nonetheless, what we do as Christians is really the natural fulfillment. In fact, St. Paul, just so you all know, you don't have to have your children circumcised. If your children are circumcised, it's completely fine. But if you actually read St. Paul in the Acts of the Apostles, there is a very clear decision that because of Christ coming, Christians do not need to be circumcised. Why? Because baptism was the new circumcision. And baptism was not exclusively for men, but was for, for women as well. Because the whole view that Christ brought was a broader vision of how people were incorporated into the kingdom. So both men and women, and that, now, that then became the sign of inclusion into the family of God. So in the Old Testament, how do you, if your son wasn't circumcised, he, he's not part of the kingdom. He's not part of the family of God. So baptism becomes the new way that we are incorporated into Christ and made a member of his family. So what happens in baptism? Two things, two, are, two main graces happen in baptism. One, a child's sins are washed away. And two, new life is given. Both of those have direct correlation to the element used. What is, what is the only element necessary for baptism? Water. The oil, the candle, and the cloth are optional. When I get invited to the NIC unit and there is a baby, I don't anoint the baby's oil with, I don't anoint the baby's head with oil. I don't put a white garment on the child and I sure as heck don't light a candle. What is necessary for baptism? Three drops of water. Literally with a sterilized dropper, I baptize the child with three drops of water with my hands like in the incubator. God makes the most 
necessary of sacraments the most accessible? Human beings can't live without water. So what's all that's necessary for baptism? Three drops of water. If I am on the side of the road and I see a car wreck, I always try to stop. I've never yet had the moment, like, I've never had it happen yet where I've gotten to do it, but, like, I dream about it all the time. I've heard people's confessions that are on the side of the road, like, dying or whatever, but I've never had, like, the side of the road baptism, but, like, I'm waiting for it to happen in my life. But, like, all it will take is for me to take a bottle of water out of the back of their car, because everybody has, like, old bo- bottles of water in their car, I think, don't we? Some of you might be, I have, like, 20. Um, all it takes is three drops of water. Now, this is, this is what's really cool. Like, if you don't know this stuff, this is really awesome. If you don't know this, you can baptize. So the minister is also the most accessible as well. Am I over time? What time is it? Okay, good. <clears throat> so not only is, it, is the element the most accessible, because you think about, like, the other sacraments, like you need oil, you need bread, you need water, whatever else. The minister is also the most accessible. So... Any baptized Christian can baptize someone. There's a lot of grandmothers who baptize their their grandchildren when their own children have fallen away from the church. Like, there's been a lot of bathtub baptisms, whether you know this or not. Because anyone can baptize. This is where it's going to get crazy, so just follow me here. In fact, you don't even need to be baptized. So let's just say, so like we have RCIA class, right? We have people over that they meet on Thursday night at 6.30, and some of them are not baptized. So this is completely true. Let's say they get in a car wreck. They're on 74, and they think they're going to die. And someone comes up to their car, and the person's like, hey, uh, they're, they're trapped in their car, but they can talk. I don't know. Just follow where I'm going with the story. <laughs> they can say to the person, like, um, I'm not baptized. I think I'm going to die. Can you baptize me? And the Jewish person can be like, what? I'm Jewish. And he say, it doesn't matter. All you have to do is what's intended. So the intention of the Jewish person, and the, and the person who's dying can be like, just take that bottle of water in the back of my car and just pour it on my head and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's all necessary. I baptize you in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the minister is the most accessible. The element is the most accessible. And what is the element? Water. What does water do? It cleanses, and it brings life. I hope your children use water all the time to cleanse themselves, right? Like, nothing is clean in your house without water. As even, like, the CDC will agree, antibacterial, uh, what's that stuff called? Sanitizer, hand sanitizer, is not as good as, as washing your hands, right? Washing your hands is better than antibacterial hand sanitizer. So it cleanses. But it also brings life. Where did we all live for nine months? In water. Women, what did, where did you all carry your child for nine months? In water. We live in water. We're born through water. But also, if we don't have water, we all die. Every living thing needs water to live. So the sacrament of baptism that you gave to your child, the greatest gift, you were the best parent on that day. It's all been downhill since then. But you gave the best gift to your child that day, which is eternal salvation. Their sins are forgiven. They are made a member of God's family. Like any good gift, though, that gift needs to be unpacked and used again and again and again and again and again and again and again. We can take gifts and we can put them on a shelf and not use them. We all have closets or some of you might have entire rooms that are full of things that people have given you that you don't use. Baptism is a gift that needs to be unpacked, and through that gift, we again and again realize that we are forgiven. We realize that we're a part of a family, which is what baptism does. Now, those other three symbols. Number one, the oil on the head. Remember when your child smelled really, really good? That oil is called chrism. It's a perfumed oil. That oil is put on their head. Jesus, is, Jesus does not have a last name. So sometimes people like think that Jesus' last name is Christ. It's not true. 
Christ is a title. He would have actually been known, he would have been known, they didn't have last names or anything, he would have been known as Jesus, son of Joseph. The word Christ is a title. The word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos. And the word Christos actually means the anointed one. Jesus, the anointed one. Jesus, the anointed one. The Messiah, the anointed one. So we anoint newly baptized Christians. We get the word Christian from Christ, which means the anointed ones. So we anoint children as soon as they're baptized. That anointing is to be in remembrance of the fact that they have been claimed and made for Christ. The white garment that they receive is because we start dressing them right now what their end goal is. What's their end goal? Heaven. What, do, what color does everyone wear in heaven? White. So we dress them up like we want them to be. Dress for success, right? Dress up like you want you to be. If you want your child to like be a really good football player, then like you buy them little onesies that look like a football player's uniform. If you want your child, like we, we dress them like we want them to look. That's why you wear white on the day of First Holy Communion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the church. The candle, of course, is a symbol of the light of Christ, which we're called to keep burning brightly. Notice when, when someone dies that the water, the white garment, and the candle all come full circle into play. We meet you at the back of the church. For those of you who have a baptism outside of Mass, which now all baptisms are outside of Mass because we can't do them during Mass during COVID-19, but the rite of baptism starts at the back of the church. That's where we start funerals. There's a sprinkling of the body with water, a covering with a white cloth, and the Paschal candle, the Easter candle, is put up by the casket because we believe that baptism, which washes away sins and makes an, a, a member, an individual a member of the family of God is what ultimately leads them to eternal life. So the role of baptism is key. The 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 children do a lot in the atrium with baptism, uh, with the Paschal candle, the white garment, the oil. So those are all things that, they, that they're, they're regularly um, familiar with. And then um, the last session that will be covered this time is really, it's just, it's the life of Jesus. So it does a, just a really good job of just the, the, the synopsis of the fall, meaning the fall of Adam and Eve, and then the reason why Christ came uh, to ultimately save us. So those are our sessions, one, two, and three. If we can try to get those done, um, different parents always find different things. Some people watch these little videos while they're driving in their car. Some people watch them on Sunday afternoons. Some people uh, set a time every week to do them. Um, some people try to cram them all in uh, two days before we have our next adult session. So um, Whatever works for you, uh, make that happen. But I just, I, I, I hope that you will enjoy this as well, these sessions. And uh, you'll notice after a few of them, your child will start singing the theme song because it's really annoying. Um, that's all I have. Any other questions? Any, any questions? I totally love questions. No? Okay, I'll give you my blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Thank you, everybody. Drive home safely. I think the rain just started.